Hello, I am Robert Boyd. Please join me as I consider the role of the public historian in the information age. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says that historians trace historical developments by preserving and analyzing data from various sources. They educate the public through different programs and presentations, and they provide insight on topics related to history. I want to use the phrase public historian to describe historians who do not work in academic or corporate settings. The American Historical Association states that these public historians work for the federal, state, and local governments as well as historical societies. They work at historical sites like battlefields and at museums and government agencies. Some public historians advise government leaders while others interact directly with the public. We live in a world where vast amounts of information are available with the click of a mouse. As this graph by marketing consultants Millward Brown shows, the number of ways that we receive information has grown from 1704, when the first newspapers ran advertisements, to the present day. Please note how quickly new media channels have been added in the last two decades. With everyone able to gain access to data so easily, why should they need historians? I want to show how historians' skills are vital to understanding how the world around us came to be and how the knowledge might help us shape the future. In the digital age, public historians will help citizens navigate a sea of data to address current issues by sharing knowledge of the past and demonstrating historical practices. One of the problems with the flow of information in the modern world is the sheer amount of information that is available. The classical Greek historian Thucydides wrote, Most people, in fact, will not take the trouble of finding out the truth, but are much more inclined to accept the first story they hear. When a web search query delivers thousands of results in a fraction of a second, how does the user select the truth from the first result they find? Daniel Memmi, a computer science professor at the University of Quebec, explores this problem of information overload in an article published in AI and Society. Memi observes that we have systems that excel at retrieving information, but they have not kept up with evaluation and contextualization. In other words, digital systems give us a lot of information, but little help in figuring out what is trustworthy and why it matters. Before the information age, publishers acted as a social institution that helped evaluate information. The investment the publishers made in producing printed media gave them an incentive to publish quality information. This does not exist in the digital world as anyone can easily make a website or post to social media. Some new institutions like Wikipedia are emerging that might help us with assessing data but according to many, they are still fragile and subject to abuse. Furthermore, as Wiltford, Hellman, and Gerlitz explain in their article, The Politics of Real Time, the devices we use to access data also affect how urgent we think new data is. The news feeds we find on social media networks are influenced by how often items are shared and reposted. News stories that are months old can still rise to the top as current items that demand immediate attention, just because they have recently been retreated by many users or even many bots, computer programs disguised to look like human users. What are the consequences of not having tools that help us find the truth so quickly as we find new links? To start answering that, I want to discuss cognitive dissonance. Everyone experiences the feelings of cognitive dissonance at some point in their life. The Encyclopedia of Emotion describes cognitive dissonance as a feeling of discomfort when we try to hold two conflicting ideas at the same time. Because we try to avoid uncomfortable situations, we act to minimize the apparent conflict between opposed ideas. The story of the fox and the grapes illustrates how this works. A fox sees some grapes growing in an arbor and decides they look delicious. Unfortunately, no matter how hard he tries, the fox cannot reach the grapes. When the fox cannot reach the grapes he wants, he cannot simultaneously hold on to the idea that he wants grapes and the idea that he cannot reach them. So the fox decides the grapes are probably sour and walks away. 
when we try to relieve cognitive dissonance, the easiest way of reducing the conflict is often to just dismiss a new idea that conflicts with a long-held belief. Sometimes we go so far in rejecting an idea that conflicts with our beliefs that we assign nefarious motives to those who promote new ideas. Because we feel discomfort when faced with opposition to our beliefs, we even avoid media sources that might disagree with our political ideologies. In the increasingly fragmented media world, partisan news organizations actively exploit cognitive dissonance to increase the loyalty of their core audience. In his articles, Just the Facts, Partisan Media and the Political Conditioning of Economic Perceptions, political scientist Ian Anson shows how news organizations use partisan cues to change the way their viewers perceive the same neutral economic information. For example, a news outlet that supports the party in power will present a good jobs report as the result of the administration's policies. But opposition media outlets will claim the same data is the result of factors beyond the administration's control. We have populations with very different perceptions of reality because they consume media that reinforces their beliefs instead of just presenting neutral facts. Journalism professor Paolo Mancini has argued that we are almost at the point where people practically have personalized news outlets because media outlets are forced to find their target audience. The fragmentation has become so severe in some European countries that political parties have formed from social media posts pushing a single issue. Because we no longer have authoritative journalistic sources, democratic political systems become stymied as elected officials do not know what is shaping their constituents' opinions. Increasing media fragmentation driven by cognitive dissonance can have dire consequences. On August 12, protesters and counter-protesters gathered in Charlottesville, Virginia. The protesters claimed to object to the proposed removal of a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Clashes between the protesters and their opposition turned violent and resulted in the death of an unarmed counter-protester and two state troopers. On the surface, both sides claimed they were acting from very different views of American history, as represented by the statue. In the aftermath of this violence, many Americans tried to find an explanation for what had happened. On August 15, President Trump said this about the situation. Are we going to take down, are we going to take down statues to George Washington? How about Thomas Jefferson? What do you think of Thomas Jefferson? You like him? Okay, good. Are we going to take down the statue? Because he was a major slave owner. Now, are we going to take down his statue? So you know what? It's fine. You're changing history. You're changing culture. As somebody who's training to become a historian, I was concerned by the phrase, you are changing history. Can you really change history? Let me tell you about somebody who tried. This is Horemheb. He was the pharaoh of Egypt from 1306 to 1292 BCE. Horemheb's predecessor, Akhenaten, had imposed revolutions in Egyptian religion and art. Horemheb was so offended by Akhenaten's changes that he tried to erase all traces of his actions and existence. As Egyptologist Warwick Pearson describes Horemheb's destruction of the images and temples of his predecessor, the faces and hands of Akhenaten and his queen Nefertiti and their names were ritually defaced that take away their power and erase their memory. Faces of Colossi of Akhenaten were smashed and the statues pushed forward and buried in that position. Stone walls were dismantled and the blocks recycled in Horemheb's pylons. Their reuse was carefully planned so that remaining scenes on the blocks faced inward so they could not be seen and the blocks were placed upside down and under a huge weight of new masonry to ritually place the heretical religion under the power of the traditional religion. Wormheb's efforts were successful. Akhenaten was forgotten by generations of Egyptians, but in a way, he was too successful. According to Warwick, Horemheb's efforts preserved the artifacts of Akhenaten's reign. This is an image of Akhenaten and his family that was saved for us when Horemheb used it as building material for his temple expansion at Karnak. 
Akhenaten is one of the most commonly studied pharaohs because students are fascinated by the mystery engendered by Horemheb's attempt to remove him from Egyptian history. So you can try to change history as we've seen, but you may not get the result you were hoping for. The president may be looking at the issue of Confederate statues not as an effort to erase history, but as a means of changing our culture. Some people see these statues as a way of commemorating the bravery of American soldiers, even if they are fighting in a misguided cause. If that is the purpose behind the statues, using a statue to teach history may misfire. This is a statue of Robert E. Lee at the Antietam National Battlefield. According to the local newspaper, Congressman John Delaney has introduced the bill to remove the statue. Let me tell you a little about the site where this statue is located. During the 12 hours of battle at Antietam Creek near Sharpsburg, Maryland, 23,000 American soldiers were killed, wounded, or missing. Antietam was the bloodiest day of fighting in American history. If there is any place to put a monument to the bravery of Southern soldiers, this field where thousands of Americans fought and died is such a place. However, the statue is a bad way to teach about that history. It's not hard to imagine that visitors to the battlefield hundreds of years from now might think this is a statue of General George McClellan, the Union commander. First, there's no statue of McClellan, the general whose troops held the field at the end, end of the day at the monument. Furthermore, General Lee could not hold his binoculars during the battle as he does in the statue. The general had fallen and sprained his wrist during a storm in the days leading up to the battle. According to a letter that Lee wrote to his wife, he did not have use of his hands until days after the battle at Antietam. This National Park Service map shows Lee's headquarters. The statue is over here on the other side of Antietam Creek, near McClellan's headquarters. So you can see, somebody might see the statue and think, hey, it's McClellan. Now, there is a plaque attached to the statue, which identifies it as being of Robert E. Lee. But even then, future students might be confused by the statue. Lee was opposed to slavery and succession and fighting for the right of people to, for self-determination. But he was fighting on the Confederate side? Using statues to teach history can be confusing. We need historians. Historians that will do what we've just done in this presentation. We have looked for and examined sources to explain the past and put it into context for understanding how we might shape our future. Thank you for watching my presentation.